Hello, everybody. This is Fickleova2000, and I am going to tell you some very interesting stories about some very exciting things that I've done in the past. So, you know, I used to be at school, you know, back in... I'm going to go through all of those years, one of the best experiences I had in the past. Like, let's take a look back at 2003. So, back in 2003, I was a really, really big fan of PBS. I remember watching lots of shows on PBS Kids, and they included shows like, like, Clifford, The Big Red Dog, and Dragon Tales, and Sesame Street, and Teletubbies, and Booba, and Caillou, and Sagwa, the Chinese Siamese Cat, and and Zabumafu and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood as well. So I was a big fan of PBS back in 2003. So, and what I love the most about those PBS Kids shows was the PBS Kids logos that appeared at the end of the shows. And since it was 2003, there was the original six PBS Kids logos. So since this was 2003, they had the original six PBS Kids logos still being used. So... <clears throat> So, out of all the original six PBS Kids logos that I've seen, the most common ones I've seen were the first two ones from September 6th of 1999. They included two variations. One included a close-up of an eye that blinks with the camera zooming out to reveal that it is a boy named Dash, and he was scratching his head and trying to think about something, and then he went, DOINK! <clears throat> and then the circle would zoom out, the thought bubble would form with the letters PBS on it, and it would be on a... on a pink and white striped background for the Dash version. And as a special treat, before I tell you the others, let me just get these PBS Kids logo sound set up real quick. All right. <laughs> so. It was the Dash version from 1999. So, this is how the Dash version of the PBS Kids logo sounds like. Please let me know if, if you can hear it okay. So... You know what? I might turn it up a little bit. So, that is what the 1999 PBS Kids Dash logo sounds like. I'm doing great. How about you? So, and then the other variant of the 1999 PBS Kids logo just started out with with Dot with a girl running up to the screen. Dot the girl runs off from a faraway angle and then getting closer and closer to the screen and then 
he would, she would turn, turn to one side and then turn to the other side and smile. Now, this is what the 1999 PBS Kids dot logo would, would sound like. Okay, so this is what the dot logo sounds like. All right. That was what the dot version sounded like, so... So those were the first two PBS Kids logos from 1999. I saw those the most common, but the dot one I saw... But the dot one I saw the most common out of all the others, so... And then... And then, there was those two PBS Kids transformation logos that premiered when Clifford began broadcasting on television on September 4th of 2000. And, um... And there existed two versions of the transformation bumpers. Well, of course, there was one version that had Dash, the boy, transforming from a caveman to a scuba diver to a robot to a robot and the background was was a very dark grass green background at the beginning and then it turned into a blue background as it became water and then the green and then and then turning into a dark blue background with stars being shown of course the dash transformation variant as Dash transforming into the into a caveman, scuba diver, and robot. And then after turning into the robot, he would grab the letters PBS on it. And then the circular PBS Kids logo, Dash's circular PBS Kids logo would be shown on a pale spring bud background with dark blue bubbles wobbling and shaking. And... This is what the PBS Kids Dash Transformation logo would sound like. And then there's another version. Oh. Alright. Just for you, Julie Mimic, I'll play it again. Okay, the dot... Alright. Now moving on to the dot transformation logo. Now, the dot transformation logo is basically the same as the dash transformation one, except it shows dot in the foreground rather than dash. And she transforms into a tiger, then to an octopus, then to an astronaut. And then after turning into the astronaut, she floats up like like astronauts would do, and then smile and go, Dot? And then, and then Dot's circular PBS Kids logo would be shown on a dark blue nighttime sky background with a bunch of stars in the sky. And this is what the PBS Kids Dot transformation logo would sound like. As a matter of fact, you just heard it. So. And then. And then. And in the last two of the original six PBS Kids logos premiered in January 21st of 2002, back when Cyber Chase premiered, and, there ex and they were animated at primal screen. And there existed two variations of the 2002 PBS Kids logos. One version included 
a started off with a gr one version started off with a green background with Dash the boy looking into a fishbowl or looking at a goldfish in a fishbowl and then coming close to the fishbowl and then Dash would imagine himself as an orange goldfish and then he would get eaten by Dot as a green fish and then the PBS Kids circular logo with Dot would be shown and there would be bubbles in the background with a with a turquoise watery background with with white bubbles floating upward now there existed two versions of the PBS Kids Fishbowl logo. One included the regular version that that is shown on shows like Super Y and Word World. And there existed a prototype version that was on Jakers, The Adventures of Piggly Winks, um, Lomax, The Hound of Music, and I believe Sid the Science Kid also used it earlier episodes of Sid the Science Kid. <laughs> Now, and then, as for the prototype version of the fishbowl logo, it's basically the same as the regular version, but the plants are a little different. The, the fish, the close-up of the fishbowl is zoomed out slightly. It's more of in a widescreen format. The word kids is added at the bottom, and the orange and green fish are slightly off the screen. Okay, now this is what the PBS Kids Fishbowl logo would sound like. Okay, that was the Fishbowl version. And then the other version of the PBS Kids logo that was animated at Primal Screen that came out at the same time as the Fishbowl one is, of course, the one that has a winter-like background and it contains Dash ice skating in an ice skating rink. And, and then, after feeling the ground shake, he stops skating and then the camera zooms out to reveal that he is inside the snow globe And Dot, the girl, holds the snow globe, and Dot has powdery blue skin in that bumper instead of the regular lime green skin. Dot has the powdery blue skin in the snow globe logo. And then, and then Dot's PBS Kids logo would be shown on a powdery blue wintry background, and there's a lot of snowflakes coming down in that logo as well. Now, like the Fishbowl logo, there also existed a prototype version of the Snow Globe logo, where the background is a lot darker, the ice skating rink is shaped slightly, and the animation's a bit smoother, the trees look completely different, they're more purple, um, and the snowflakes are bigger and brighter. It does not snow in the background when Doc holds the snow globe in the prototype version compared to the regular version where it does snow. And Doc is looking down in the prototype version compared to the regular version where Doc looks directly at the viewer. And then the word kids is added at the bottom in the prototype version of the snow globe logo. And this is what the PBS Kids Snow Globe logo would sound like. <sighs> now that I explained the original six, I would like to tell you um, what, what shows I saw in 2003 with those logos. Of course, I, I watched all of those PBS Kids shows back in 2003. 
back in 2003 at that time. Well, there are a bunch of other ideas from 2008 and 2013, but there are a lot of them, so I'm not going to explain those. I am only explaining the original six because there are not that many variants, only six of them, so... So, now that I told you about the PBS Kids logos, the original six, um, now I'm going to say all of the, the shows I saw with those system cues. Of course, I started watching all the shows back in 2003, so, so, first off, I'm gonna start talking about the shows I saw in 2003 with the 1999 Dash variant of the logo. Now, Back in 2003, I saw the 1999 PBS Kids Dash logo on shows like on shows like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Caillou and Teletubbies and Booba and Sogwa the Chinese Siamese Cat and Sesame Street and Dragon Tales and Clifford the Big Red Dog and George Shrinks and also the Berenstein Bears and Seven Little Monsters. So, I saw that logo quite a lot in 2003, so, yeah, those were the shows I saw with the 1999 Dash logo, and as for, as for the Dash logo on Dragon Tales, I saw the Dash logo after the Season 1 funding on TV, and I saw the... Dash logo after the Season 2 funding on TV. Of course, this was 2003, so Season 3 didn't air at that time, so I only saw the Season 1 funding and the Season 2 funding. And then... And then as for the Dash logo that I shot on Clifford, I saw the Dash logo appear after the Season 1 funding, and after the Season 2 funding. And, um... And I believe the Season 1 episodes of Dragon Tales that I saw on TV that had the Dash logo on it, I believe they were Ord Sees the Light and The Ugly Draggling. And... And I think Miami or Bust and Light My Fire Breath also had the 1999 Dash logo at the end on TV airings. And I think Ball, the leader, and Max and the Magic Carpet also used it. <laughs> and then... I believe the Clifford episode I saw... According... There was a program break recorded after... Clifford that I used to see that had the 1999 Dash logo and it read the episode titles and they were Clifford Cleans His Doghouse and BB Makes Four and these episodes had the 1999 Dash logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get to that. So, that was the Dash version I talked about. Now the shows, now the shows I saw with the 1999 Dot logo back in 2003 were shows like I also saw the Dot version on Dragon Tales. I also saw the Dot version on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I saw the Dot version on Sagwa. I saw the Dot version on JG the Jet Plane. I saw the Dot version on Teletubbies. So, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Dragon Tales, Teletubbies. Sog with the Chinese Siamese cat, JG the jet plane. I saw the 1999 dot logo on Zabumafu as well. And the 1999 dot logo on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, like I was saying. And. And yeah. I saw the 1999 dot logo after Dragon Tales. After the season 2 funding of Dragon Tales, but. But I don't 
but I didn't see it after the Season 1 funding. I only saw the Dash version after the Season 1 funding, but I saw both the Dot and Dash variants after the Season 2 funding. And I, I didn't really see the Dot version after Sesame Street either. Well, I didn't really see Between the Lines that much, so I can't really explain that. So, but I can tell you that the shows I saw with the 1999 Dot logo were Dragon Tales, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Kai, Caillou, Sogwa the Tiny Siamese Cat, Teletubbies, Zaboomafu, JJ the Jet Plane. And then, and then, uh, about the PBS Kids Dash Transformation logo from 2000, I only saw it on one show. And the only show that I saw with the PBS Kids Dash Transformation logo in, from 2000, back in 2003, the only show I saw in 2003 with the 2000 PBS Kids Dash Transformation logo was, of course, the show Arthur. was, of course, the show Arthur, and it was back in 2003 when I saw the Dash Transformation logo on Arthur, and, and in the PBS Kids Dot Transformation logo, I only saw on two shows. I know Arthur also used the Dot Transformation variant, because I also saw the Dot Transformation variant on Arthur. And I did see the Dot Transformation logo on Clifford the Big Red Dog as well, besides the 1999 Dash logo. But there is something really weird that happened at the end of one of the Clifford the Big Red Dog episodes I was watching that had the Dot Transformation logo, and it was a big help in the trouble with kittens. And the Dot Transformation logo accidentally used the audio from the Snow Globe logo from 2002. And it had the Season 2 funding since A Big Help in the Trouble with Kittens were Season 2 episodes. Now the R for funding, now the PBS Kids Stash Transformation logo, I saw that after the Season 7 through 8 funding used on Seasons 1 through 4 reruns. With the yellow background, and I think I also saw the Dash Transformation logo after the green background as well. On TV airings. Speaking of Arthur, I have a ton of DVDs with the PBS Kids Dash Transformation logo. I have more Arthur DVDs with the Dash Transformation logo than any other PBS Kids logo. Speaking of which, on one of the Arthur DVDs, Arthur the Big Riddle, there existed a very abridged version of the Dot Transformation, of the Dash Transformation logo on Arthur the Big Riddle DVD release, and it just started at the part with Dash is a Robot. Like I said before, I haven't really seen Between the Lions that much. And then, the shows I saw in 2003 with the 2002 PBS Kids Fishbowl logo, I actually saw both versions of the PBS Kids Fishbowl logo, believe it or not. I saw the regular version of the Fishbowl logo that faded in and out on Season 7 of Arthur, and it appeared after the green background of the Season 7 funding, uh, the regular version of the Season 7 funding with grants from Ready to Learn, U.S. Department of Education, Public Broadcasting Service, and, and Corporation for Public Broadcasting.
and I saw the fishbowl, the regular version of the fishbowl logo that faded in and out on Arthur after the season seven funding with that green background, like I mentioned before. Believe it or not. There actually is a PBS Kids program break. It says the program break is from 2002, but the program break is actually from 2003. And it it was off of my PBS station. It was called Rocky Mountain PBS, RMPBS. And it showed the Season 7 funding with the green background being followed by the PBS Kids fishbowl logo that faded in and out. And then, and then the prototype version of the PBS Kids Fishbowl logo I saw on Jager's The Adventures of Piggly Winks. So, well, I didn't, I, I saw the Word World episodes, um, Sheep's Halloween costume and the big sleepover. But I didn't really get to see the PBS Kids logo because I changed to a different program when the credits started. And... And I didn't really see that many episodes of Jakers. I only saw a few of them. So that's why I only saw the Fishbowl logo on Jakers, because I didn't really see a lot of those episodes. And then, there was only one show I saw in 2003 that had the PBS Kids Snow Globe logo. And it was, believe it or not, it was Sesame Street that used it. I saw the PBS Kids Snow Globe logo right after Sesame Street ended back in 2003 when I was watching the show. And believe it or not, it was a season 34 episode of Sesame Street called four, episode 4038, where Big Bird writes a story. And and those episodes had, had a bunch of penguins on there, and the Emil's World episode was Wild Animals. And that episode had the snow globe logo at the end. And there's also a program break recorded after that particular episode. <sighs> and... And yeah. So, now that I explained the original PBS Kids logos, so, so the Dash version I saw on Dragon Tales, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Dragon Tales, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Caillou, Teletubbies, Booba, The Berenstain Bears, Seven Little Monsters, George Shrinks, Dragon Tales, Clifford, Sesame Street, and stuff. Now that I explain the original PBS Kids logos, I'd like to move on and talk about other exciting things that happened in the past. So, one of my favorite times, besides 2003, of course, was back in, was back in high school, actually. 
or eighth grade. So, actually, one of my other favorite times besides 2003 was back back when I was in sixth grade. I got to be part of the band in the school. And when I was in sixth grade, I played the trumpet. And I was pretty good at playing the trumpet when I was in sixth grade. But then when I was in seventh grade, I moved on to the euphonium, which is a weird name for a brass instrument, but that's what it's actually called, a euphonium. And I played that when I was in seventh grade. If you don't know what, it's, what a euphonium is, it's basically like a slightly smaller version of a tuba, which which has the same range of notes as the trombone, basically basically plays the same range of notes as the trombone. And it's and the euphonium is played in a tenor key, tenor, which is basically higher than bass. And then, and then, when I was in eighth grade, I played a mix of the euphonium and the t I played, when I was in eighth grade, it varied depending on the days. I played the euphonium on most of the days, and the tuba on Tuesdays and Fridays. It's pretty decent. And and when I was in eighth grade, that's when I played the euphonium on most of the days and the tuba on Tuesdays and Fridays. It was actually called a baritone horn. So, the euphonium was actually called the baritone horn. So, I didn't really see modern PBS that much, but I did. Rec and I. Another one of my favorite times was when I was in third grade back in 2009 to 2010 where every day after school I, every day after school Arthur episodes would be recorded on Rocky Mountain PBS and I've watched those Arthur episodes every single day after third grade ended in 2009 to 2010 Because every day in 2009, right after I got off school, I've watched a lot of Arthur. And in one of the episodes of Arthur that was recorded when I got off of school back in 2009 was, believe it or not, the Arthur episode, Elwood City Turns 100, where the Elwood City gang puts on a play to honor the centennial. And then, later on, later on, Buster accidentally wrecks the stage and feels really ashamed of himself. And he was like, oh, you're right, Brain. I did ruin everything. I'm such a failure. If anybody wants me, I'll be in the janitor's closet. That's what it sounded like. That's what it sounded like when he said those exact lines. And then we go on, 
on the sixth grade. I played the trumpet in sixth grade. Then I played the euphonium in seventh grade or the baritone horn in seventh grade, of course. And then, and then I played the euphonium on or baritone horn on most days when I was in eighth grade, and the tuba on Tuesdays and Fridays. So, yeah. And then after that, I actually got to go to high school. And when I was in ninth grade, I just saw something. And, um, and then I was in, and then I got to be in ninth grade in 2000. 15 to 2016 and I got to play the tuba entirely throughout all of my freshman and sophomore year yes I did so And there was something that I've never seen before. There was an instrument that I've never seen in the high school band before. I've, I've, I've seen it and heard it in many episodes and videos, but I've never actually seen it in band before. Uh, there was a student in the high school band, and he was playing the bassoon. And if you don't know what a bassoon is, it is basically a very low-pitched woodwind instrument that plays in bass and tenor range, which is which is much lower in pitch than an oboe. That's what a bassoon is. And believe it or not, I actually have really because believe it or not, believe it or not, I actually know that the bassoon was actually the most common musical instrument that you heard in Dragon Tales episodes. Of course, you know, there was one, st one student playing the bassoon when I was in high school. One student was playing the bassoon. Other students were like playing the flute and clarinet and trumpet and trombone. And me and another student were playing tuba. And then at one point in high school, I actually participated I have not seen Word World that much, so. <laughs> and believe it or not, the bassoon is also heard in Elmo's World segments of Sesame Street as well. Did you know that? Because I, I kind of like those musical instruments, especially the very low-pitched ones like the bassoon and the tuba. So, so in high school, uh, there was one student that was playing the bassoon, some other students that were playing the trumpet, trombone, clarinet, and flute, and, and of course, I was playing a tuba, and there was another student that was playing the tuba with me as well, and... And actually, no, 
the names of the students. The and and then at one point in high school, I actually got to participate in a parade by playing the tuba. Well, you know, everyone was like marching in a parade and I was playing the tuba. And speaking of which, speaking of which, just like the bassoon was the most common instrument heard on Dragon Tales, I know the tuba was the most common instrument heard on the Flintstones, which I think I think the tuba fit perfectly for the for the TV show since there, there was cavemen in the show and stuff like that. <laughs> and of course, the Flintstones aired aired at a much earlier it aired, the Flintstones aired much, 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 much earlier than Dragon Tales. Even though Dragon Tales aired in 1999, the Flintstones aired in 1960. So... The instrument that was heard the most on Arthur was the electric bass. The electric bass, or the bass guitar. Mostly because it was reggae. I know the tuba was heard the most in the Flintstones, and the bassoon was heard the most on Dragon Tales. And the instrument that was heard the most on Arthur was the electric bass. Or the bass, also known as the bass guitar. <laughs> and did you know that the piano was heard the most in Clifford? You know, you know what's very interesting, Jeremy? Wow. <laughs> what's interesting about what's interesting, Jeremy, is every time, every single time. I watch like an animated cartoon or something like like Dragon Tales or the Flintstones or Arthur. I always like to listen to what musical instruments are heard in the show because I because I know what instruments sound like. So
So we know the bassoon is a very low-pitched woodwind instrument that is much lower in pitch than an oboe. And the tuba actually plays much lower than the trombone. And I also heard the tuba a couple of times in SpongeBob and and also in VeggieTales and I also heard it on I also heard I also heard it on on Teletubbies and stuff like that. And so in high school, there was this bassoon player. There was, there were some trombone players, some trumpet players. There were some French horn players. Yes, there is. There were some French horn players. And there were actually three tuba players. I was one of them. The other two tuba players that played were, were students named Toby and Anthony. They, Toby and Anthony also played the tuba along with me. And then, believe it or not, there was something really rare that I've seen. One of the tuba players was actually a girl playing the tuba. Most of the time, I saw boys playing the tuba since, since that happened. But I actually saw one girl playing the tuba once. Which is pretty interesting, actually. I saw most of the, most of the flute players in the band that I saw were girls. Most of the tuba players that I saw were boys, with the exception of one of them, which was a girl. And, and the person that was playing the bassoon was a boy, so. But then, when I was in 11th grade, which was my junior year, and unfortunately was my last year at school um, before I dislocated my kneecap at the end of my junior year, so in junior year, I saw there were two bassoon players instead of one. One of the bassoon players was the same boy I saw, and one, and the other bassoon player was a girl. And then, and then, there's one more thing I'd like to tell you about. And this happened two years ago. And also, there was another show I forgot to mention that had the bassoon as well, and it was the 1985 Berenstein Bears series. Okay. Yeah. There's one more thing I'd like to tell you about, and this happened two years ago.
So, you know what happened two years ago that was really exciting? Because well, in 2019, it was September of 2019, I actually went to a graduation trip. I actually went on a special graduation trip to New York, and we had so much fun there. We stayed in New York for like a week from September 11, 2019 to September 18th, 2019. And we and we um we took a plane to New York. And it was like a four hour drive, a four hour flight. And we went and we went to New York. It was so much fun there. And you know, once we got out of the plane, we went to the hotel. We went to a hotel in New York. And believe it or not, you know what I did on the very first day in New York? It was a plane that we went to, so... On the very first day that I went, on the very first, on the very first day in 2009, on the very first day I went to New York in the graduation trip in 2019, the first day I went there, I actually went to the hotel, and believe it or not, I actually watched this DVD. In New York, it was Dragon Tales Adventures in Dragonland from the creators of Sesame Street and Sony Pictures Family Entertainment. And of course, Sesame Street was made in New York. And we had so much fun in. So, on the first day, I watched this DVD of Adventures in Dragonland at a hotel in New York. And this, in and this DVD... The stories were really great on this DVD, or in the first story, Ord was trying to avoid sharing the cupcake to Mr. Marmadoon, but then he realized it was the only way to get out of Kingdom Come. Then in the next episode, Cassie is like babysitting, babysitting his, her sister Kiki. And and her squishy pops. Yeah, I know. 
I know Sony Pictures is. But, but think of it this way. I actually watched Dragon Tales, which was produced by Sesame Workshop from New York. I actually watched Dragon Tales that was produced by Sesame Workshop. I've actually watched it in New York, believe it or not. And then in Baby Troubles, uh, Cassie's sister Kiki's squishy gets squished and pops. So they try to get Kiki a new squishy to make her better. And then in the next episode, Bad Share Day, Cassie discovers a magic crayon and she really wants to use the I saw it on Sogwa once. I saw it on Sogwa the Chinese Siamese cat. Um, I think these were the only three shows I saw with that logo. And in Bad Share Day, Bad Share Day, in Bad Share Day, Cassie discovers a magic crayon. She really wants to have that crayon, but her friends are still using it, and this makes Cassie a little bit mad. And then she tells her the reason why she needs the crayon is to make her mom a get well card. And believe it or not, there was actually one scene in Bad Share Day that was really funny. You know what that is? It's when Wheezy draws something called a Wheezy phone, which is basically, which is basically Wheezy, which is basically Wheezy's version of a tuba. And he blows into it, and and everyone like covers their ears due to the loud sound, and and then Zach draws headphones to muffle the sound. Isn't that funny or what? And then in Zack takes a dive, Zack is afraid to swim at first, and Wheezy tries to encourage Zack to try it, And then, and then Zach eventually likes the swimming. So, and then, and then Zach helps a turtle learn how to fly. And then, of course, in the last episode, The Forest of Darkness, which was actually the second half of the first episode broadcasted on TV. They travel to the Forest of Darkness. Ord is very afraid at first. But then, Ord discovers that there are some good things that the dark can bring, like the bright stars in the sky. And... I, and like I said before, speaking of which, I was thinking of a season four episode that would repeat the season one episode, Zack Takes a Dive, and it would be called, it would be called, it would be called, It would be called Cassie Takes a Bath. And that episode and these episodes would have the have the 
fishbowl logo at the end. And, and you know what was quite interesting about the DVD of Dragon Tales Adventures in Dragonland, Jeremy? Well, it was released on Jeremy Barton's fourth birthday on August 1st of 2000. And not only that, even though Sesame Workshop is mentioned on the packaging, even though Sesame Workshop is mentioned on the spine, the back cover, and the disc art, the actual DVD contains the 1997 Children's Television Workshop semicircle logo with the words Play It Smart at the bottom. And then the next day after that, we actually went to... Central Park, and believe it or not, that was the exact same park All right The next day after that I actually went to Central Park and believe it or not Central Park was the exact same area that the Sesame Street 25th anniversary special was taped Sesame Street Jam a musical celebration Sesame Street Jam, a musical celebration, was actually was actually taped at Central Park back in 1993, and then it was broadcasted in March of 1994. And Jeremy Barton has told me something really interesting about the TV broadcast, and he told me that the TV broadcast of Sesame Street Jam, a musical celebration. Where, yeah. And, and Jeremy Barton told me that TV broadcasts of Sesame Street Jam, a musical celebration from March of 1994, have a slightly different version of the Bells clanging tune from the 83 CTW logo. Which, he told me that the main differences between the special version from Sesame Street Jam and the actual version from The Best of Elmo is the bells were a little reorchestrated and the clang and ding sound were a slightly higher pitch than the regular version. But I'm not going to show you the rare version because I don't want to get a copyright claim by Sesame Workshop, so... It's best to just, just tell you all from memory instead. So anyway, in other words, the slightly different version of the Bell's Clanging Tune could be considered a prototype version of the Bell's Clanging Tune, right? And yeah. Anyway, back to the topic. Did you know that... I, did you know that that Central Park where I went to on my graduation trip in 2019 was the exact same park where they filmed Sesame Street Jam, a musical celebration? It was the exact same area where that special was filmed. And I actually went to Central Park, and on the first, when we actually went there twice. And I, 
wasn't it interesting that I actually got to go to the exact that I actually got to go to the exact same park in 2019? Wow. And then And then interestingly, I also got to meet Elmo at the park and we had a nice conversation with Elmo back in 2019. We actually went there twice. First we met Elmo on September 12th. And then something very interesting happened on September 13th. You want to know what that is? So, And strangely, all the Dragon Tales DVD releases, including Adventures in Dragonland, they all contained a 1999 PBS Kids logo with Dot, the girl, running up to the screen. Even though TV broadcasts use both versions, with, with most broadcasts using the 1999 PBS Kids logo with Dot, the girl, running up to the screen, like the DVD releases, even though even though some airings on TV had the Dash version instead. N okay, now the most interesting thing that happened on September 13th, 2019, was when we actually went to Jim Henson's uh, Muppet Workshop. We actually went to Jim Henson's Muppet Workshop in 2013, or, or September 13th, 2019. And we went to Jim Henson's Muppet Workshop, and we actually saw the exact same puppets of Sesame Street that appeared in the actual show. We saw the real Sesame Street Muppets from the TV show in the Muppet Workshop that I went to. And what was even more exciting was I got permission to voice all of those characters while the puppeteer was controlling the Muppets. And, um... In... I saw a few pitch I saw one of the picture frames from the second season of the Webulous World of Dr. Seuss that the Jim Henson Company also made, like Sesame Street. But I got to see all the Sesame Street Muppets and stuff. And then I believe on September 14th, we went back to Central Park and we took a walk around Central Park. Well, actually, actually, my parents, my mom and my grandparents were taking a walk. And I was in my wheelchair and we did a nice walk around Central Park. And then, on September 15th, 
we actually went to a place called Coney Island in New York. And, and we actually got to eat the hot dogs from Nathan's. So the Nathan's hot dogs were really, the Nathan's hot dogs tasted really great and on that trip to Coney Island in New York. The hot dogs there tasted really amazing. And then, on September 16th, I, we went to the Staten Island Ferry. On September 16th, we went to the Staten Island Ferry. And on September 16th, uh, we actually went back to the hotel after we went to the Staten Island Ferry. And we actually got to watch the 1988, the 1988 film called Beetlejuice with Michael Keaton. That was because on the next day, September 17th, we actually got to go see a Broadway musical, a Broadway version of the show. We got to see a Broadway show based off of the film a Broadway show called Beetlejuice, and the show was amazing on September 17th. And, and of course, the version of Beetlejuice that I was watching on September 16th before we went to the Broadway show on the 17th was, of course, the 1997 DVD release of Beetlejuice that we were watching together. And stuff like that. And then on September 17th, on the very last day in New York, we actually went to see a Broadway version of Beetlejuice in an actual stage. We actually got to watch the Broadway version of Beetlejuice on stage. And it was so much fun. And then on September 18th, we, we flew back from New York and back home to, and back, back to this home. So, okay, that, that was a video of all of my most exciting experiences. And what did you think of this story that I told about all the exciting things that happened over the years? Did you really enjoy those stories? If you did, then... Okay, everybody. Now, I'm going to get off the stream, and I will see you guys later. And see you soon, everybody. Goodbye for now.